take two minutes to uh, introduce you all uh, to this session. Firstly, welcome to all of you to the Sankal Global Summit 2020 and to this very, very important and timely session on the evolving landscape of off-grid solutions in Africa. Um, I am Prachi. I uh, represent the energy and climate change team at IntelliCap and I will be your host for the session. And if there are any issues or any, any kind of uh, uh, message that you need to send across, you can share the chat window and share it with me and, and the larger team. Uh, just before I invite our moderator for the day to introduce herself and our panelists who have uh, been gracious enough to join from all over the world. We have panelists from Amsterdam, from UK, from India, uh, uh, and from Nairobi joining us today. Uh, before I go on uh, to them, uh, I just want to lay down the agenda for the day. Uh, we will uh, be having a, a short round of introductions, which uh, our moderator will uh, be doing for us. And we'll also follow that up with a launch of a report that we have recently uh, done with the Signify Foundation. Uh, this will be followed by a 60 minute panel discussion and we'll have 15 minutes for question and answers towards the end of the session. So we encourage you to put your questions uh, in the chat window, which we will be compiling and sharing with the moderator. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I uh, just uh, want to highlight that in terms of the panel discussion, we uh, hope to kind of hear the supply side view in the first half, the first half of the discussion to understand from entrepreneurs what the key market barriers and opportunities are. And in the second half of the discussion, we have some of the ecosystem builders with us to get an ecosystem view of the landscape. So uh, without uh, uh, waiting further, I would like to invite uh, Shelma Theory, who is from Power Africa, who's a moderator for the session to introduce herself and introduce the panelists and take the discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you, Prachi. And thank you everyone for joining this session. Uh, like Prachi said, my name is Shelmi Theory. I am I'm a Power Africa contractor and I specialize in market development advice for the off-grid energy sector in Kenya. Now, we are joined by a uh, distinguished panel of speakers. Um, and first of all, we have Mr. Luke um, Duras. Please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Um, Fair enough. He's a, yeah, he's the COO of Mobile Power Limited and the co-founder also of that company. And Mobile Power um, believes in the battery rental and is that is the key to unlocking the energy markets um, where traditional energy solutions struggle. He'll give, me a, give us a brief of his company when we move to the discussion. And then the other person that joins us is Dr. Nicola Lozenby, who comes from uh, Innovate UK and she's the innovation lead, energy, clean growth and infrastructure. We are also joined by Mr. Harry, I don't even know if I pronounce your last name. He's the head of global public and government affairs in Signify. Well, thank you very much for joining the session. Um, we have um, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Tripathi. Um, he's the director general of the International Solar Alliance. And then finally, um, we have Mr. Uh, Dr. Amit Jain from the World Bank and he's a senior energy analyst. And before we proceed to the discussion, I would like to invite Yag Nakana, who is the director of Signify Foundation and the Global Head of CSR to unveil uh, Signify and IntelliCAP's report titled Mapping the Off-Grid Sector in Africa. And she'll also share her insights on that report. Yagna. Thank you, Shelmet. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. It's an uh, honor to be here. And Really happy that finally the reports that we've been working on for a while and the IntelliCAP team has done an excellent job of can be shared in such an open source platform and a very relevant platform. So the driver behind the reports for us uh, when we started looking around for data on that would inform our strategy at Signify Foundation, our primary goal and mission is to be able to enable 
uh, value chain actors across the entire value chain in the energy access sector and the in the off-grid services sector uh, to be able to use our resources to address their barriers you know what to growth scalability whatever barriers whether it's in the manufacturing you know uh, design uh, distribution financing capacity development across each of these very specific elements we we were looking at how should we design our strategy and what we realized was that we did not have enough data from the field you know we are sat here in amsterdam and we did not really have uh, the insights that would help us make very good informed decisions. It was very much of an ad hoc basis uh, where people reached out to us by chance, uh, really, that we were able to use our resources to support them. So it actually, that was the genesis of the entire, um, you know, what, what has now become a report. It was going to be just information and data that we wanted to gather that would inform our strategy um, about the landscape that we were wanting to impact. And the choice of the five countries was actually defined by two uh, things. One was, you know, which are the most material, which is why you see Nigeria and Ethiopia there, two of the largest uh, potential markets. And then uh, the ones that we knew least about. Uh, we knew very little about Sierra Leone and Senegal. And these are places that we were looking to uh, go beyond just a lot of, you know, in East Africa. There's Shell Foundation has an excellent Uganda country report, uh, as we all know. We were looking to go into a location where there was not so much of data available. And when the Intercap team actually, uh, we, we saw the initial drafts, uh, uh, the data that they managed to gather and the information and the insights that we have there, they are actually in themselves an, 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 an enabler for anybody who's in this sector, whether you're a technology provider or you're a distributor, to be able to immediately have an one space open source uh, opportunity to be able to map, I want to go into Senegal and I am operating there. Who are my uh, colleagues? Who are my peers? Where can I go to get um, distribution uh, tie-ups, alliances? So what it would be a crime to not have this uh, information out open source uh, available to everybody who's looking to uh, make an impact in whatever way as a donor, as a financer um, in that sector. So that is why I'm really, really pleased that we're able to launch the five country reports today. Um, I think uh, they, it will, they will go on the chat section in a minute, uh, the link. And it's um, look forward to having more of such. I think um, this kind of data and information is key. I was very, very heartened to see recently, I don't know if uh, others have yet seen it, is the East African Regional Handbook on Taxation. You know, we've done the mapping here on what the private sector and what uh, from the solar sector space but a big enabler, and uh, Mr. Tripathi knows this, we've discussed this multiple times, is, um, is regulation. Governments are making either subsidy programs or, um, or relief in taxation and import duties that will really help the, the sector to scale up. So th that is the other, I, I do believe, other space where there should be more of information data available for all of us. Um, which I saw that there was a recently the East African uh, book on taxation, which maps exactly all the taxation uh, per country uh, applicable, which is such a good resource as well. Uh, so really look forward to hearing back uh, also from everybody how we could do better in the future and uh, what other countries, what other data and information we could include. And a big, big thanks to Santosh, Ankit, and not in the least Prachi for making an absolutely brilliant effort with this report. We are very proud. Thank you. Thank you, Yadna. And we're looking forward to seeing the insights in that report. Um, before we proceed, I uh, would like to mention that, just like Prachi said, we would like to set the context of the discussion. And it's really to understand from the private sector and the entrepreneurs in the panel, what are the barriers and what are the emerging opportunities in the sector? And then from the ecosystem players, what can they do? Uh, how, what kind of support are they providing in order to scale these off-grid energy solutions? And to set the stage, I would like to invite Harry to um, give us a, a summary of um, how the landscape of the off-grid sector has changed. I believe Harry has been um, in the sector for quite some time. If you can briefly give us an overview of how the sector has evolved, and then you can talk about um, some of the work that Signify Foundation is doing in the sector. 
and, and tell us some of the opportunities that you see. So, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Shalmith. Um, <clears throat> maybe first a, a few words uh, about us. Uh, so in, in general, as formerly Philip Lighting and now Signify, uh, but also personally, we believe very much in cooperation. Uh, so some of the global challenges are larger, let's say most of them, than for anyone individually. <clears throat> this is also why, <clears throat> sorry, this is also why in 2009, at the second uh, Lighting Africa conference, as it was called uh, back then in Nairobi, uh, we, I remember very well at the site, at, let's say in the, at the sidelines of the conference, we sat together with 15, something like 12 or 15 stakeholders, including the World Bank, a, num a number of the new startups uh, like D-Light, uh, Green Light Planet. And we, we also said like, yeah, we are addressing these markets, each of us individually, uh, we see there's a lot of potential. Uh, yeah, at the time there was still 1.3, 1.4 billion people without access to sustainable energy. But we also saw that the whole development was going far, far, far too slow. So that's when we when we united and we, we actually led the foundation for what became to be uh, GOLA, so the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association. I've had the privilege of serving two terms in total six years as the president until last year. And you see that GOLA is really addressing a lot of the technology challenges, the policy challenges, business models, financing, also financing actually of upstarts who are quite often cash deprived. But then also as, as Signify, we created the foundation that actually Pranya has, has brought to, to, to maturity. And where also we work in the off-grid sector, providing support to, to startups. And so products, technical support, but also capacity building. And sometimes I like to think about the analogy uh, with the time that when my grandparents were born, uh, they were born a few years after Philip Lighting was founded in 1891. And at that time also nobody in Europe and certainly nobody in the Netherlands had electricity. And you could see that when people had access to electricity, the first service that they addressed was lighting. And that helped them also to, uh, <clears throat> to further develop education, small and medium sized economic activities. And from there, yeah, an acceleration of social economic development took place. So this is really why have we invest our efforts uh, in all the modest size that, that, that we have in, in the sector. If you look at main barriers, in the sector for growth have until now actually the sector has been growing by roughly 13 percent year on year uh, we estimate uh, that the number of people without access to sustainable energy and lighting is a little below 900 million so that's quite some progress but still it's going too slow and this year with the impact of covid we've seen that in the first half of this year had uh, then yeah, the, the total market sales level was down 26 percent I, I think also had this should ring some alarm bells uh, because we see that everywhere where there's a large division in society that uh, this feeds and this impacts uh, the, the stability going into the future. And we see that even today somewhere else in the world are playing out in, in, in very disturbing ways. So I think the, the first main barrier that I would like to address is how do we look conceptually at the whole off-grid sector? How do we see this? Because we can look at what I would call underlying barriers. So uh, affordability, access, uh, doing away with import duties, uh, having policies that actually had then help people gain access to, uh, to these systems, uh, looking at distribution. But I think the first bigger barriers is that we should, we should conceptually see the off-grid sector as one of, as, yeah, let's say social economic development urgency. Uh, if we look a little bit at the rounded off numbers, had 900 million people, uh, even if it's a billion, uh, that's like 200, 250 million households. If every household <clears throat> would have a solar home system or any type of solar lanterns, uh, you, you would roughly speak in very round numbers of $10 billion. If in this decade uh, of sustainable development till 2030, uh, that would be like a billion. Even if it's 2 billion a year, it's peanuts money. If you see have all the, the trillions even and that we are investing globally in COVID relief. Uh, even, even yesterday in the news here in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands there was a big debate about saving our national airline, which is our national pride at KLM. And even there, the money is far beyond uh, what is needed uh, per year in the off-grid sector. So, so a point that I would like to make is that we collectively, but also at national level, identify the off-grid sector as one of urgent 
socioeconomic development, but also one that with analogies in, in other parts of the world that would bring a lot of, yeah, a lot of social and a lot of economical development benefits to any of those countries. Because then indeed, if people start, uh, let's say educating, have you know all the stories about people being able to do their homework in the evening, uh, investing in socioeconomic development, being, becoming self-sustained uh, in their livelihood development, this will, this will contribute much more and much more significantly uh, to a country's progress, uh, let's say, as probably many other sectors have where investments can take place. Added to that, a lot of focus is on, on let's say, the, the, the residential, so the rural, the community yeah. of grid part of the sector. But there's another hugely important area where we need to look at how do we leapfrog uh, from unsustainable kerosene or from, let's say, sitting in the dark uh, to modern technology and business models, and that is infrastructure. So for parts in the residential sector, we're looking at how can we move to, uh, yeah, to digital connected, uh, solar LED lanterns and solar home systems, also combined uh, with business models as pay as you go. So paying uh, per use uh, through your mobile phone instead of having to invest uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 80 dollars. Uh, but the same is valid for the, for the infrastructure sector because where most infrastructure is going to be built is in emerging and developing countries like Africa, India, and some other countries. And there also we need to leapfrog. And we see the huge potential uh, for solar LED street lighting, also connected solar LED street lighting, and that brings a, a smart backbone to any kind of that infrastructure. Because if we don't, then even there, then yeah, we would be lagging behind uh, in opportunities for development of communities and, and a country at large. And then maybe also looking at, uh, at another area next to that, which is of, of real importance and where we're making uh, some of our disaster relief efforts through the foundation is in healthcare. Because uh, particularly there is a high demand of healthcare all around the world. But if you look at emerging developing countries, then healthcare centers are also a sector, is also a sector where we should be looking at uh, yeah, providing support in solar lighting uh, yeah, for treatment of existing patients and also, also quite often uh, for pregnant women. Uh, but in this case, also to enable treatment uh, of people who, so, let's say, have been affected by the coronavirus. So maybe I'd stop there. But overall, I would say, uh, let's see this also, the entire sector as a socioeconomic development opportunity. And at one uh, where if combined uh, public-private sector, we put in really the money that is needed uh, to provide universal access to sustainable energy, it is actually going to, do, yeah, going to ask far, far, far less as any of the economic challenges and COVID relief that we're looking at globally. And it would certainly also help us had then, yeah, providing and, and guaranteeing more inclusive development in a world set today that is very much in need of that. So I'll stop there, Sean. Thank you very much, Harry. So you've talked about the, some of the factors that have led to the development of the sector, evolution of business models, but then to, to move forward for the 900, under 900 million who don't have access to electricity, then you need to um, take extra steps, like you said, social and economic, seeing it as a social and economic development opportunity. Um, we'll hear from Luke, um, we'd like to hear from you in terms of uh, your work in the off-grid sector and what has been some of the enabling factors and please share also the challenges and after that, we'll move to Dr. Nicola because innovation is key. We'd like to hear from you too. Hi so guys, we'll and then- um, uh... Sorry, Sorry <laughs> Simon. Go ahead. <laughs> good, good morning, everybody um, from the UK. And, uh, and, and thanks, Harry, for um, I think a, a great introduction to, to the scale of the challenge and the opportunity that we're all looking at together here today. And, and also Harry for, I think, you know, more than a decade of work um, sounds like forming what we get to sit in today as an ecosystem. And indeed, that's that's where mobile power started. Um, we were really encouraged by the, the growth of solar home systems um, in sub-Saharan Africa and, you know, meeting the need of, 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 of about half a billion people so far, um, the market of solar home systems and, 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 and other innovations. But what we saw at mobile power was, was really a, a large section of the market that 
would never be in a position to afford solar home systems and um, would never be in a position to make sense of, of mini grid connections um, from a commercial perspective without you know very large subsidy um, and so we said look what we what can we do about that what can we do about that today and um, we saw there was a fantastic opportunity for business model innovation and we believed that what needed to happen was to create a solution through technology that would allow people to access energy on a, a truly pay-as-you-go daily basis. So um, we thought, how difficult could that be? Turns out it's quite hard. Um, but actually, what we're operating today in, in Sierra Leone, Uganda, uh, the Gambia, Zambia, um, uh, Liberia, and soon to be Nigeria, is a battery rental model. So we'll go into a, a, a location that we've identified um, and we'll install about five kilowatt peak of solar. The solar um, charges lithium ion batteries, which are rentable, rentable through an agent network um, and customers pay in cash for just one day's use of that battery. So what it means is that there's no debt obligation um, from the customer. There's no credit extension um, obligation from mobile power's perspective. We're just renting an asset for a 24 hour period and that asset can, can do all the kind of things that a solar home system would do all the way from running large appliances like TVs all the way down to lighting. Um, and what we find is that we're serving customers who have an income of less than $2 a day with their daily energy needs. Um, a lot of those guys, it's just about lighting and, and some mobile phone charging. Um, we're seeing customers rent once a week um, to charge their phones, all the way to customers who are renting five to 10 batteries on a daily basis. And, you know, we're really excited. Um, we're, we're scaling up at the moment and, and significantly growing the number of hubs that we're, we're offering. Um, and we're really excited because I think one of the largest challenges um, has been reaching into that, 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 that end of the market that have less affordability, that perhaps have incomes that are very volatile even from one day to the next, never mind through the seasonal seasonal um, times of the year to do with, with harvesting and crops. But the other opportunity that we're beginning to meet now um, goes along with what Harry was talking about with healthcare and, and, and also other infrastructure assets. Um, our solar hubs um, pay for themselves, including all of the batteries and everything in under a year and have about five years life. So what we've been doing in Uganda so far is partnering with a, a healthcare organization who own um, a lot of community health centers and installing our mobile power assets on their health centers, over installing the solar um, so that the health centers are provided for with, with solar power. But the revenue generating asset that's the mobile power um, platform generates enough income from the immediate community to run that healthcare center, to pay for the solar and electrification of that healthcare center. So one of the things that we're really excited about is how we can leverage that community buy-in to reach exceedingly poor customers, but also to extend services to them that otherwise wouldn't be commercially viable. And to do that in a profitable and in um, and, and a way that can grow very quickly. One of the biggest challenges um, that we always face is access to capital. Um, I'm, I'm sure people are bored of hearing that, unfortunately, but um, if you want to grow an infrastructure game, it's, it's expensive. Um, so we're just closing our Series A, which is exciting. But um, I think when we look at the scale of the challenge, certainly this bottom end of the market that um, have an affordability gap with the majority of currently available or widely available solutions, um, we're really excited. Um, to be working with people like Nicola at Innovate UK, who's helped us get off the ground. But the, the challenge for us looking ahead and the access to capital and, and certainly debt is, um, is the next thing that we're looking at. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Luke. Um, so um, basically, if I'm right, you're talking about how do you reach the poor customers sustainably mm. and also be able to um, get the right type of finance to support your business to be able to address those customers? That's right. I think um, reaching, reaching very poor customers, I think in general, if you look across the sector so far, has, has, has definitely been identified as a challenge of, of, of looking at subsidy or how can we, how can we create ways of, of helping these customers? Um, and I think Mobile Power looked at it a bit differently and said, look, 
if you want to have a scalable business and it has to be scalable to meet the challenge of the remaining 900 million people who need access to these services, it has to be profitable. You have to be able to leverage private capital into these solutions that, that people want to make a return on. Um, whether we like capitalism or not, it's, it's here to stay, probably. Um, and, um, and so we, we needed to create a, a solution that was profitable. Um, we've done that. I actually think we're, we're at the profitability end, I think we're one of the more profitable um, uh, energy solutions, which kind of surprised us. Um, we've yet to scale significantly, so we'll see how that goes as the challenge of, of, of growing with scale. But yeah, we, we really believe that we needed to create a profitable solution to reach to reach the poorest customers. Um, um, and, and we've seen the early fruits of that at the moment. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hearing about a profitable solution is encouraging and gives hope <laughs> about being able to address the 900 million also who still lack access to electricity. Um, I think innovation is key to, to, to the development of the sector. Um, I, I think everybody agrees how, what the role that innovation has played, whether it's in the business models, whether it's in the products themselves. So Dr. Nicola, can you please give us an overview of um, Innovate 2K's work and what are the interesting models that you can see um, uh, coming up? Yeah, sure, thanks for that. Um... As you've just heard from Luke, um, as he mentioned, mobile power has been funded by Energy Catalyst and there's a whole range of Energy Catalyst funded projects um, within Sankalp. So I encourage anyone who's listened to this and is an Energy Catalyst funded project, just to type into the chat and introduce yourself for everyone to see. So the background in Energy Catalyst is, it's run by Innovate UK, which is a government innovation agency and Energy Catalyst acts as a springboard for innovators to, as Luke mentioned, de-risk the early stage of their innovation and give them the opportunity to accelerate and demonstrate their solutions for the ending of energy poverty. So it really gives this sort of, gets you over the first value of death, so to speak, in the innovation landscape. So far, Energy Catalyst, we've supported about 345 projects, which involves over 300 individual organizations. And the reach of that is across a total of around 140 million that's been invested into these projects. So there's a diverse set of projects we've funded. So these range from biomass to energy storage, um, solar technologies, and we've got a strong representative portfolio of projects which bring multiple technologies together. So we quite often um, fund projects which bring maybe solar with storage together and things like that. So that brings us on to kind of one of the barriers to this is how we foster and develop the collaboration between the UK innovators and the international um, parties out there to really benefit from these kind of technologies. So yeah, international collaboration can increase the effectiveness and really bring the benefits and maximize the impact of the technologies in country. So to date, we've worked with 113, I think, if I remember my last count correctly, um, of international partners. And yeah, it's been really great to see that we've reached around 28 different countries, um, which includes Eastern, Western, Southern Africa, and Sub-Saharan, Af um, South and Southeast Asia, sorry. So yeah, that's kind of an overview of the Energy Catalyst program at Innovate UK. Um, some really cool projects have came out. So hopefully there's a few in the chat box that's popped up, but you've also got the likes of Swanson Smart Store. So they're working on intelligent solar and storage systems. And uh, this is all to do with providing reliable and affordable household energy. Um, this is particularly important for areas with weak or stressed electricity grids. So the likes in Zambia and Botswana is where they're working. And they're one of our early stage projects which we're really supporting with both the funding and the market and customer, customer engagement side of it. So I should mention Energy Catalyst isn't just a, here's some money, go and get on with it. We actually run an um, acceleration program, which really develops the commercial side of the businesses as well as the tech development. So another cool one we've got is Solaris Kit. They're developing and testing 
the world's first prism shaped flat pack solar thermal collectors in Rwanda. So this is low cost thermal heating solutions and it lets you effectively harness the sun to lower your water heating costs. And another one would be Aptec who are looking at small scale pay as you go solar water pumping. And this small scale makes it accessible for farmers in remote systems. And the ability to pay at the pump is obviously, as Luke's already mentioned, allows a lot more flexibility and reduces the need for debt and loans and things like that. Good, thank you. Uh, and like you mentioned, uh, the productive use of energy or energy being able to help the, uh, the consumers generate revenue is key and the small scale solar water pumping is, is a great, great uh, innovation um, story. So I, I think in conclusion, in terms of challenges uh, from your perspective, what I got is how to move the products to market, how to move the innovations to market seems to be one of the challenges, right? Yeah, correct. Um, this is partly why Energy Catalyst developed the acceleration support around the grant funding, because our grant funding will take the technology so far, but we really need to ready these businesses and create the connections and network and interactions to take them the next step. So what happens after our grant funding program and how do we embed these technologies in country with the end users and really broker and foster those collaborations? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great to hear about the new innovations whether in storage or having intelligent solar. I wonder what that is. <laughs> um, I think we've heard from the private players, we've heard from uh, people who are active in the market, we've heard from people supporting innovation, and now we move to the ecosystem players. So to you, uh, His Excellency, um, would you please, Tell us the role of the International Solar Alliance. What is the International Solar Alliance? What's its role in promoting the sector, the off-grid energy sector with specific uh, context of Africa? Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Salmit. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, thanks to Intelcap also, who has, uh, you know, who have brought so many people together so pleased to you know uh, uh, listen about mobile power about uh, the innovate uk i think we can have an MOU with them uh, separately after this is over and uh, mr harry from signify of course has some good news that i can share with him about what we are doing to you know create a market uh, uh, and of course uh, amit is my colleague and uh, uh, what uh, I'm not going so much to tell about what ISA is that this is an international organization, treaty based. It has some 88 members, uh, uh, signatories, and 70 are members. We have got a first amendment in place, which is uh, yet to get ratification by 30 countries. Then ISA becomes universal. But I'm just going to limit my uh, point to say that what actually, what is that new thing that we are trying to do to make. Uh, uh, off-grid uh, popular. So there are big things we are trying to do. I mean, uh, again, as you say, we are trying to innovate. Uh, we may succeed, we may fail, but uh, but good ideas never fail in the world. So I think these are good ideas. Idea one is uh, we are trying to create a world solar bank. In fact, uh, uh, the assembly of ICER, uh, we, we had some 38 ministers, uh, you know, it met between 14th of October to 16th this uh, year. So what the assembly has done, uh, they have identified uh, 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 10 countries and have formed a steering committee uh, along with three more experts to, uh, to translate this dream of the assembly to a world solar bank. Now, these countries are of course, India and France are there. Then we have uh, UK, we have uh, uh, Netherlands uh, and from Europe, we have Mauritius and Niger and from Latin America, we have Cuba and uh, uh, Guyana and from Asia Pacific, we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Nauru as well as uh, Fiji. Now, this committee, along with three, uh, uh, you know, experts and of course the director general of Aisha, uh, we are going to lay a roadmap for this World Solar Bank. But why I'm mentioning is that it's a small bank actually in global standards. It's not hundred billion dollars, you know, equity are talking about. We're talking about two billion dollar equity, uh, which can raise uh, eight uh, billion in the market, co-finance to the extent possible, bringing in around fifty billion maximum uh, each year 
to the uh, you know for solar projects both you know brownfield and greenfield but then the special thing uh, that focus will be there in this world solar bank you know it is a bank that will understand the sun you know it will it will it will have all the patience that sun has you know be kind to others don't charge too much i mean the sun doesn't charge anything to that matter it doesn't discriminate about rich and poor you know town and village so but this bank when you say it will understand the sun which means it will have three things together skill speed and uh, uh, scale because solar financing requires prompt uh, timing it takes 6 months to put a forth you know 3000 megawatt solar park so uh, and then you must have that it, you, you must not understand that electron which comes it is not the same electron that you get from elsewhere it has a lot of implication for climate warming and you know uh, so this bank is one of the first things that isa is doing and two, what we are doing, of course, we have come up with this big idea of one wall, one sun, one grid. And uh, that too, we have just commissioned a study uh, and uh, Amit will be talking more about that because we have partnered with the World Bank and the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. But sometimes we dream that, you know, they were connected through a common grid, although not just like a perimeter, but then it can be an interstellar date line. It can be bent to go touch cities of high consumption. But it will simulate, you know, the consumption pattern and the peak hour and the non-peak hour and the hot spots where wind or sun and the solar derivatives can be combined. Uh, it is something that we are trying. And here often it will play uh, uh, an important role because the type of one sun, one world, one grid we are talking about, off grid is not really off this grid. And uh, that, that I'm not going into how it can be integrated with that. And uh, Third thing that we are doing to promote off-grid is, uh, of course, you know, companies like Snyder and uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Philips uh, earlier now signify, they will be very happy to know. We believe that the two, million, two billion women who have no access to clean energy fuel uh, should not be treated as poor so that you know, they're outside the system and you, know, you, you don't do anything. We believe it is a potential market. So we are trying to convert these two billion women into a potential market. And give an industrial roadmap to them. So, uh, and equally, 700 million people who have no access to electricity. So, as I speak, with the help of uh, EESL, we have floated a tender for nine million home power systems. A home power system is not a home lighting system. You know, it takes the aspirations of the you know person who have no access to electricity. And uh, along with this nine million home power systems, which is a solar fan, a, you know, a mobile charger, which maybe have a solar uh, refrigeration system. Uh, and five bulbs. So along with 47 million home power systems goes 15 to five, 250 million LED bulbs. So, and what is that thing we have done? We have totally price discovery tender. 53 countries have participated in this. So this uh, 50 million is actually the aggregate demand of uh, home power systems. So we did something similar for 272, uh, 270,000 solar pumps. And we brought down the price by 45%. So we believe that you know this also in this exercise, if we can bring down the price from six hundred dollars to say by 20, 30, 40 percent, to that extent we are giving an indirect subsidy to the poor, and we are encouraging the industry to do uh, this thing. We call it demand aggregation exercise, and this is the second time we are doing. Uh, first time we did with pumps, now we are doing with um, you know solar uh, home systems. We try to expand it to solar cookers. We can expand it to solar vehicles. We can expand it to solar storage, solar cooling systems. This is something we can actually aggregate demand of all member countries together and go for a sort of, you know, creating a roadmap, uh, encourage the industry to participate. Uh, and this is something ISA is playing an important role to reduce the cost in the off grid market. So create more purchasing power with the so-called people without energy access, so-called countries without energy security. That is, uh, you know, uh, the third thing that ISA is doing. Now, the fourth thing, we also believe that, uh, you know, R&D is very important, you know, for off-grid particularly. And, uh, and R&D is something which you can't import from other countries. It has to be come from within each country. And to, we, we believe that in our member countries, we will create a system, you know, a sort of, you know, national solar center. We call it STAR, you know, and STAR centers, everything STAR is something in the sky. Um, and this solar technology application resource center will be country specific, we will have a regional model, but the whole idea is off grid. You know, it has so many appropriate technologies, so I'm not going into the details, but it's an important sector. It creates employment, brings in investment, 
but it's be, needs are peculiar and then you know world solar bank will be capturing some of these and uh, that is the fourth thing the star see will bring in to look after uh, off grid models and business models particularly but these star centers will be in a sense local capturing global models uh, and uh, they will attend to local needs and local models because some of the things can be done uh, very uh, you know at uh, least expenditure locally and uh, what do you do next of course that is the fifth item capacity building of course now everything has become virtual you know actually when we talk in the computer i feel that is real because you don't need anybody else uh, to make it uh, real uh, virtually you feel to be real so we aim we have seven programs you know solar farms mini grids rooftop finance solar cooling heating solar storage and uh, under each program we train 5000 people but then the training will be a little different it is all types of stakeholders that we'll bring together for example the farmer you know with the help of fao and others that we are trying to train it is not merely about the pump the farmer will be trained the farmer will be trained about crop management about water management about soil management so it's a comprehensive thing and about soil income management because the moment you have a pump and you get water and you get three crops in place of one you undergo a revolution in terms of your income and how do you manage this income uh, so these are the type of new things that we are uh, you know uh, trying to do and these are the five points I, I, I covered. And I'm sure as we go along and more and more countries join us and World Solar Bank becomes a reality. And we bring in the storage economy where you know, each farmer can actually charge batteries, sell it to the local, uh, uh, you, know, you, you call it storage bank on the national highway, which now uh, you have thousands of petrol bunks where you give diesel and fossil fuels. Now when they are outdated and they don't work at all, you don't need them, you did, do with solar batteries. And millions of solar batteries of various hues and uh, various capacities, and they are all filled up. And they create a decentralized economy in and around those uh, battery banks on the road. And who will building a main role? The farmers. You can go charge batteries, go and sell, bring back the exhausted or uh, dry down batteries, and uh, you keep on the uh, you know keeping the loop open. Uh, so these are the things that we are uh, working on, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, you know we are also with the help of WRI. Uh, creating a report for $1,000 billion, how actually the investment roadmap will bring in for each member country. And uh, we also, with help of Ansel Young, uh, bring a doing solar uh, business, uh, ease of doing solar business that's very useful to the industry. And uh, we have uh, uh, just launched the ISA care program, which again, you know, solarizing the hospitals uh, and uh, dispensaries in uh, developing countries particularly you know, island countries, so the vaccine from, uh, you know, when the COVID vaccine comes, that can be uh, stored and that can be distributed. We have got a Cisco program where we are bringing industry partners, uh, and I hope uh, companies like Signify and all that they become members of the Cisco. This is, uh, you know, this is the uh, common forum, the collective action forum for climate action that we have uh, created. We call it Coalition for uh, Climate Action. Uh, right now we have uh, uh, around 14 members, uh, SoftBank, of course, they put in $2 million from Japan and the Chinese uh, company called CLP, the member, and the rest are all Indian PSUs. But this forum, you know, gives the, they sit together, the corporate sector, they give their wish list to the ministers and to the assembly, and uh, we try to involve more and more. And there, you know, we have fixed that off-grid will play an important role. And I'm very happy that, you know, uh, uh, things like Innovate UK who are here and, uh, you know, mobile power, the model I talked about, um, uh, the exchange model, I, I must uh, complete, I mean, end my uh, talk with a story from Djibouti. You know, when we went, we walked uh, and we went to a village uh, where there is a small mini grid looking after some 300 houses. There is a lot more demand. And when I met the Honorable President, he told me, look, your son, your solar is creating a lot of problem. I said, I mean, I went to the village. I found it was very happy. They were all, uh, he said, no, you know, more and more villages are coming into that village because earlier it was a nomadic uh, place. You know, people just camp for the day, evening, halt, and then you go out. The day you are free. Because of the sun, people are coming together and they're demanding that give us more and more this mini grid capacity. But in that same village, I also saw that youth, they have solar batteries, all, you know, although I couldn't find the company name and all that, but they do trade in that. They charge a small amount and they're doing on their own. And the youth were employed uh, in a place, uh, you know, giving solar uh, lighting. And when the water table was some 800 feet below, uh, I'm not going more into it. But uh, but the point was, you know, the unintended role that the off-grid solar is playing or the solar itself is playing, bringing, creating villages. 
you know, I mean, it, we take it for granted, but in places, because of the sun, people are coming together. And I must tell you about my village where there are two solar uh, lights and it avoids uh, two to three people dying every year because of snake bites. Because in villages where you don't have light, people die of snake bites. But these two solar lights in my village, a small hamlet in the east coast of India, saves two to three lives every year now. And that is the beauty of solar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You you covered a lot. You told us about the impact of solar, uh, impact of electrification, um, and and you've talked about very important that the something very important in terms of from the R and D localizing the solutions or the models. Um, it is I think uh, has been uh, mentioned in a number of forums, and it's it's really important. And of course, you've talked about the knowledge sharing, um, which I think. Uh, Dr. Nicola had talked about cooperation and, and can help scale all these models. And now we are, before we move on to the to concluding and, and, and to final remarks in terms of recommendations, we'll move to Dr. Amit Jain uh, from the World Bank. It's I think it's very befitting that the World Bank be the one that uh, <laughs> um, sort of concludes and tells us about some of the key programs that you've been um, doing in, in the sector and, and, and where do you see some of the risks and opportunities uh, in the sector? Thank you, Shalmet, and thank you, Santosh, for inviting me. Uh, the problem of speaking in the end especially after Honorable uh, Director General Isa is, he has covered five points, uh, three of them were mine. So <laughs> I have hardly anything to say. Um, but I will have only one message uh, for today's audience, Shalmit, which is development of bankable projects. That's the only message I want to give. Uh, it is utmost important for all of us. I'm not saying because I'm a banker, but this is what is required in, in the market. Why I'm saying? See, gone are the days, Shelmet, when we had to convince countries that climate change is happening or solar is important. Now, uh, that convincing is gone, right? Yeah. So what yeah. the Honorable Director General is trying to do by creating the World Solar Bank is aggregating millions of dollars on the ground, aggregating gigawatts, so he can pitch it as a demand aggregation to the investors. But I'll tell you, we are not worried about the financing part because the sovereign wealth funds, the private equity funds, Financing is there in the market. What is not there is bankable projects on the ground. Let me highlight uh, three specific initiatives on which the World Bank is working, especially with the ISA. First, as uh, Honorable Director General mentioned, One Sun, One World, One Grid initiative. Actually, we have Africa as a, as a stage three in the phase three. The plan is to do a pre-feasibility report. How do we connect South Asia with West through Gulf and to Africa through either through on ground transmission or via undersea cables. It is, um, I would say, it is very similar to what Desert Tech has tried a decade back, but it is on a more advanced level because now we know that tens of gigawatts are being installed in Western India, tens of gigawatts are being installed in UAE uh, and other countries. And the solar radiation in Northern Africa is, is, is huge, right? So when, as BD mentioned, when you have sun in India, let's say in the afternoon, you have morning in Middle East, and then you have even early morning in Africa. And as the sun shifts, the plan is, can we transfer the electrons from South Asia to West and then to Africa and the other way around? Because when it is afternoon in Africa, we have late in India. So the peak peak power of each country is able to uh, transfer some of the electricity in, in the other region. So that's the first initiative. It has been launched uh, with government of India and with ISA. Second is lighthouse initiatives of India and Africa. This is another thing we are working very closely. What happens is now India has come up as a global leader on renewable energy. We know that reverse auction, solar parks, solar pumps. There are several initiatives on which India has taken lead. And the question comes, what is the, what is the relationship or what is the similarities between India and Africa? There are some similarities, Shalmet. The state governments of India, hmm? the state governments are as big as the countries in Africa, but they face similar challenges like the African countries. I'll tell you why. The foreign investors don't consider the state governments to be bankable. We have land and transmission issues in the states. The off-taker risk, the utilities are struggling in the state governments. 
So, so we are facing a problem in the states yeah. to attract investment. As a country, we are getting investment. For states, we have challenges, which is very similar to the African countries. So we have an initiative called SRMI, Sustainable Risk Mitigation Initiative. It is a cocktail of guarantees, Chalmek. So it has World Bank guarantees. It has an escrow account. If the utility doesn't pay, it will come from this funded account. And thirdly, we have a letter of credit from a bank. It will kick in if the utility doesn't pay, right? And this becomes true for both off-grid and grid-connected program. For example, in Maldives, for off-grid, we have applied SRMI. For India, solar parks, also we have applied SRMI. So we are doing this study, uh, as I mentioned, uh, India, Africa, Lighthouse Initiative. Can we take some of these best practices? Because we had challenges, we had success in, in South Asia. Yeah. Can we take these challenges to Africa? And in Africa, we are concentrating on Western Africa. Why? We have a ROGEP program, R-O-G-E-P. It is a $333 million program already operating in the Western uh, countries. We are working with ICRI. Uh, and, and with ISA on that. This funding is only available for private developers where a startup company or a medium and small enterprises wants to get financing for solar pumps, for solar home systems, for mini grids, they can approach their regional bank in their country, which is then connected to the Western African Regional Bank. So this funding is already available. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create pipeline on the ground, which is bankable, and then we can feed this into the, uh, the $333 million, which is available. Again, we are piggyback on, on, on a solar pump bid, which was uh, carried out by International Solar Alliance. And we are trying to identify five countries in Western Africa where we can make actual deals on the ground. You know, because financing is available. Uh, uh, feasibility studies have been done by ISA. Can we identify the farmers or can we identify the aggregators on the ground to do this matchmaking and have at least some deals signed in that reaction. So it's very important that uh, we move from initiatives to do some deals on the ground in one or two or three countries, which can be replicated in the other African countries. The, there has been so much interest, Shelmet, on, on the India-Africa initiative. Now we have been asked to develop a India-Southeast Asia initiative. You know? So uh, it is important that we learn from some of the success stories which Africa also has, especially on mini grid and solar home system, because now you have pay as you go and other initiatives being in Kenya and some other countries, which India can probably learn from Africa. So let me stop here, Shalmin. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. You've touched on, I, I do like that we are having a theme of like learning from each other, testing, moving the, 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 the models to market and even from the World Bank taking the lead and, and providing that, um, that that program you have with ECRI, uh, which is accessible to private companies is, is really good. Um, I, we'll move to other question session. Uh, we'll, to, we'll take about 10 minutes or less actually, because we don't need to move to concluding, concluding remarks. And we'll start with Luke. Um, there's a question about the, your battery rental business model um, and, and the attendee says that uh, wh what is making yours work because the history or what some of the evidence uh, is uh, some models that have similar models that have been started have not been as successful. How is yours yeah. Uh, working? Yeah. I mean, I'll start by saying we've been through quite a few that haven't been successful as well. We've been at this seven years and it took us about five and a half to get to the point where we had a model that and serve customers appropriately and generated profit. So it took us a long time. So I think we were we we were quite persistent. Um, what are the what are the things that we did work out though? If you want to run this business model, you have to have the technology to support it. And I think that's one of the reasons that Innovate UK have been so influential in in our development is we actually have a, a patent pending um, system that allows us to control the batteries. Um, all the way through the rental process, all the way from charging um, um, rental via our agents who are commission based um, and then into the hands of the customer. And what this means is that customers have an interaction with our model, which mimics the way in which they pay for everything. So they don't have to access mobile money. 
um, they can pay our agents in cash, which is amazing for the customer. But the first problem that that creates um, as an entrepreneur is all of a sudden you're dealing with cash payments in super rural areas. So we said, how can we leverage that up? So actually what we do is each of our agents become mobile money agents. Our agents purchase activation credits from mobile power via an app that we give them on, on a phone that we also give to the agents. And what this means is that we can leverage one mobile money connection um, to around a thousand customers. So what we're finding in, is that in areas where there is no mobile network um, and there is no mobile money um, adoption or penetration, we're able to reach customers, we're able to allow the customers to pay in cash, and then we're able to handle that cash um, directly into mobile money. So we're not trying to collect cash in rural areas. That's been a first enabler for us. Um, the second big thing for us is that the battery, once activated by the agent, will only work with the customer for 24 hours. So after 24 hours, the battery stops delivering power to the customer. We're tracking that battery individually. Um, and then the agent has 24 hours to get that battery back to the charging station, recharged and back out of the customer. If the agent doesn't achieve that, then we begin to find the agent. Um, and we also have incentives on the other side to make sure that that's running. Getting the balance right between the responsibility on the customer, the fine and incentive system with the agent has been the critical key um, that's a lot of profitability in this model for us. And I think um, the dogged persistence of developing technology in, in Europe with our, with our technology guys, um, and then transferring that into the rural context in Sub-Saharan Africa and working with our Sierra Leonean team and our Liberian teams and our Nigerian teams in order to understand the local context so that we enable that technology to empower local contexts has been the key to unlocking it. Um, what, what have we unlocked? Well, basically our, our agents um, get paid commission directly in cash from our customers for every battery rental that they do. But what we've done is unlocked that truly entrepreneurial African spirit and said, look, you know your best customers, you know the best places to do rentals from, you know the best people, you know the most reliable, you know who's good for, good for trust and who's not. And we've enabled through our platform to unlock that agent model locally. Um, and it's not just a one-off payment, we're building businesses for these local agents that last for years. Um, and so I think the combination of technology together with understanding local context and unleashing um, local entrepreneurship, which is alive and well, but just very undercapitalized, um, has been the success for mobile power. The reason that other battery models have failed is it took us seven years. Um, it took us seven years of, of hard work um, and, and, and a lot of things going our way. Um, so we feel pretty good about that. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen a lot of battery rental models fail. Thank you very much. So I uh, think in just to summarize, it's localizing your solution, uh, use of technology, and uh, tapping into the local entrepreneur spirit. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nicola, a question for you. Uh, what are the top products for business model innovations that are likely to drive the off-grid energy space in Africa in the next few years? Yes, I think anything that actually combines and collaborates um, Luke said there quite well about how it was all about his persistence and actually finding the right communities and local people to work with. Um, so I think that's going to be really key. I think the biggest barrier we face is, as in we as in the UK and in UK, is looking at how we can foster those relationships and how we can actually link up and engage with different people around the world in in country. So how do we raise the profile of some of our NG Catalyst projects and the good work they're doing to really leverage and get the community buy-in that Luke's been talking about being so vital to his projects? So yeah, um, I guess it's a question to the people on the call here. If you've got any good ways or ideas of how we can get and get on board with that more and really leverage some of those relationships, please feel free to drop me an email. Um, I'm all ears for any ideas on getting over some of those barriers with in-country integration of these innovation we have. Thank you, thank you. Um, 
A question for His Excellency. How is ISA planning to leverage the knowledge sharing elements in its operations as it has been working with a number of countries which can benefit from learning from each other? Mr. Tripathi. A variety of ways. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, A, you know, we have, uh, if you look at the structure, organizational structure, we have this assembly and the standing committee that is the governance structure. And uh, from my personal experience, I find that the assembly itself is a powerful forum platform for exchange of knowledge. When we get a number of ministers, number of you know high functionaries, policy makers, and uh, usually it's combined with also, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, something like uh, renewable energy invest or, uh, you know, we call it uh, Sun World. Uh, and uh, uh, that is one. And number two is the Sun World, like we did it in Peru and we're planning to do it in Kenya and Indonesia. Now, Sun World is a hemispheral event, uh, either Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere, but it brings all countries together. Uh, policymakers, uh, industry people, and this is a powerful forum for dissemination of the, you know, the business models that we have, or what actually we are doing, or even to take feedback from uh, them. Uh, so, uh, in the southern world that we did it in Peru, the entire Latin American region was uh, involved. It was in November 2019, and uh, this year we have planned for Egypt, but because of COVID, you know, we haven't been. Uh, we are thinking whether we make it virtual, but uh, how effective it will be in that sense that we are also looking into it. And uh, number three, we have a, something called Summit. Uh, it is a meeting that we have on every third Wednesday of every month. But we, you know, we connect to all the member countries uh, represented by national focal point. Now, each member country has to have two types of people. One, NFP, the national focal point, and B, country representatives for programs. So, and we also connect the ambassadors and the high commissioners located in Delhi. It's a powerful platform. And, uh, we almost run through the month's activities and what we did, uh, you know, uh, for example, in one of the summits, we got a best practice from uh, Bangladesh where uh, they don't give pumps to individual farmers. They give it to a women entrepreneur who puts a bigger size pump and uh, sells water to 10 to 15 farmers around and based on pricing of the type of crops they grow. Now, that's a powerful model. We would like to take it to Rwanda now or, you know, Uganda, for example. So the gender issues, the employment issues, the income generating issues are also uh, covered. And uh, uh, and uh, if you look at the role of cyber platform that we play uh, for communication, you know, we have something called uh, Infopedia. It is, uh, it is essentially a solar Wikipedia. You know, you, you have got everything there that you want. and. Uh, and there we have three chambers. One is called the Chamber of Best Practice. Then we have the Chamber of Country Counter and uh, Chamber of you know, uh, Feedback, where ministers, policymakers can actually communicate, talk to each other. So if you look at the uh, best practices, we pick up best practices from various countries and populate the infopedia with, uh, with that so that others can access and uh, see. And these are the four or five ways that actually we you know, we, we try to leverage the knowledge uh, sharing elements uh, in our operation uh, as we work along with the member countries. And of course, there are many regional and local events where also a lot of communication function takes place. Thank you. Thank you for this important question. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I really like that you brought in the issue of gender. We know that involving women has multiple benefits um, in terms of uh, benefits to the economy and to the family unit. Um, and, and you talked about earmarking specific parties with the government to be able to spearhead this. And I think it, it goes towards the main theme that's coming out uh, from a learning perspective. Now, Dr. Amit, there's a question for you. Um, so Shell All On, which is an investment firm, impact investment firm, would like to know how they can get involved with the World Bank our OGEP program. Would you please uh, give a few guidelines on how they can do that? Yeah, so ROGEP program is a program where World Bank has uh, financed uh, financing from other co-lenders as well. We have Netherlands government, we have Clean Technology Fund and other financiers who have come up with grant and also concessional loans. 
as I mentioned, it has total of $333 million, out of which almost $50 million is grant. Uh, we have partnered with ECRI to develop the uh, to develop the ecosystem in the Western African countries. 19 countries are part of that. Uh, we, this is for the technical assistance program. On the lending side, uh, Western African Development Bank is working with us as a nodal bank, which has now partnered with uh, several local banks in all these countries where the financing could be sought. Now, this information is available online, but of course, uh, I will be happy to be in touch with them and connect them with the, with the relevant staff in, in the African region who is uh, leading and who, who is the right person for them to go into details for that. And as I mentioned, this product is now operational and uh, it will be good if uh, Shell's all on project is interested in this product and I'll be happy to uh, play the role of a facilitator. Great. Um, thank you very much. And, and thank you for being willing to connect them. So Francis, I, I gather you're the one from Shell all on. If you can send, I think your your probably your email address to Prachi. Uh, I, I, I hope that's okay, Dr. Amit and Prachi. Sure, okay. sure, Shelman, thanks. Okay, all right. Uh, so I think there's no other question. So we'll move on to um, concluding remarks. Would like to hear just a conclusion of all these. I think we've heard a lot of uh, many people talking of how can we be able to address um, the under, I think about 600 million who are unelectrified in Africa. Um, we've had a lot of uh, ideas uh, being floated around. Um, so can we hear from the panel? And I'm thinking we should start with the other way around. We started with the private sector and, and, and ended with the ecosystem players or supporters. And I think we should start with the ecosystem players so that the entrepreneur can then conclude and add on anything else that's not being covered by the um, ecosystem players. So Dr. Amit, if you don't mind, um, if you can please start and tell us um, from where you sit as a World Bank and given all that has been said, what do you think should be prioritized, priority, prioritized sorry, in order to uh, scale off-grid solutions in Africa? Well, only one thing, Shalmet, as I mentioned, as an investor or as a lender, what I'm looking for is assured and predictable returns. That's all I want. It's like, it's very simple. If you go to a bank and you deposit $1, after one year, you want $1.1, right? You don't want $1 to vanish. That's a very simple thing. What I would like that development of bankable policies, regulations in the country, which assures the investor that yes, their money is coming back with whatever return, 5%, 10%, 15% returns could vary, but the investor should know that yes, it's financing is coming back. Uh, in Zambia, uh, IFC World Bank, Mega Guarantees uh, displayed a program of scaling solar, where for a small program in solar park in Zambia, we were able to mobilize not only financing, but a very low PPA price reason the World Bank guarantees were standing right behind the government and saying, if anything happens, we will pay you back. So these kind of development financial innovative structures are very important, even for off-grid, mm -hmm. if we want to have the financing and conventional financing being available to the African countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. So bankable projects and of course, bankable policies and regulations very, very key. Um, as a past financier, I must say that that's very, very important. And I think the off-grid sector will not scale if you don't get that. Then we'll go to His Excellency, Mr. Tripathi, if you can please, uh, in short, uh, give, tell us what should be prioritized, maybe one point or two. You are on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, well, we, we should identify the actors, the institutions, and the ideas in each member country or in each country where off-grid could play a role. And uh, when I say actors, ideas, and institutions, uh, of course, I mean, that's a common understanding, you know, the institutions include the institutions which have money. And uh, B, uh, apart from bankable projects, you know, 
we have to also look this look at energy in access or energy insecurity as a social sector issue there are several areas where you don't have projects where you can get adequate returns but then it is an investment because without them no industrial activity can continue and uh, number 3 you know for every uh, it is like you know motivating students to go by flight the same two people travel in the flight but then you reduce you segment the pricing so that students get uh, you know become attractive by of that discounted prices so we have to have market mechanisms in place which will make these goods and services affordable by those sections in society who have been deprived for quite some time in so called 21st century world economy with 70 trillion dollars those are my three points thank you thank you and and uh, i have a question to for dr amit if once we go around through the concluding remarks if you have time i would like to hear from you whether you see the role of subsidies in off grid electrification and i think uh, amda and the sustainable energy for all has been talking a lot especially from the mini grid perspective about the need for subsidies um uh, harry will go to you if you can give us your um, key areas that you think should be prioritized Yes, yeah, so thank you, Shamit, also for the excellent uh, moderation. Um, <clears throat> I would say then, uh, yeah, we have to think uh, big, uh, but we have to act in uh, in smaller, break it down in smaller digestible building blocks. And I, I, I would divide those in four areas. So one is technology, then policies, then financing and business models, and the fourth one in communication and partnerships. So let's not forget about communication and partnership; they go together. <clears throat> On so the, so the bigger picture is that we have to take an ecosystem approach. So this is not just an energy agenda or energy access. It's also economic development. It's education. It, it's social. It's finance. It's environment. Uh, so that bigger picture is really important. So on technology, yeah, focus really on the leapfrogging to, so, to digital connected solar, uh, lighting solutions, residential infrastructure and also a bit in, in between uh, on, on the healthcare sector. And the digital is really important because where for uh, the, the analogy that I used of my grandparents had uh, then actually the electricity grid uh, was the way to connect uh, and, and, and let's say help this ecosystem develop. But here it has to be digital uh, and, and, and that can be done. On, on policies, I would say the, so the, what is overall important here is that we make this a, a national development priority with a 2030 goal so it has often been said hey, yeah universal access to energy and to lighting but then let's also quantify what it takes per country and implement the enabling policy frameworks uh, an important one has been mentioned so so don't uh, once the sector starts growing uh, don't think immediately then to harvest uh, by implementing import duties or higher vat because that will slow down actually the bigger economic benefits of people having access to to lighting and taking their livelihood development in their own hands but also yeah we need to get we need to implement quality standards yeah, because you have people who have less to spend and let's not 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 let's say risk them having to spend twice because the second time might not be possible also an investment and development facility uh, for the sector is important because any new activity yeah, needs cash had to live from uh, and this can be a combination of grants and loans in the same way as we see in economic recovery there is actually a 50 50 uh, combination of grants and loans and so this is not something that is that would be unique or that would be just like like charity it's it's a logical thing to do on financing and business models and then also important to see how can we take away the investment hurdle by making this a service focused business model and so we have models like lighting as a service where people pay per use in the same way as you pay per consumption of, of energy uh, and here then pay as you go is is really the let's say the yeah the, let's say the model that takes away any hurdles but also the model that is logical if you think about yeah, what do we really want to offer in the 21st century yeah not ownership but use and service that is what really matters even there, when you look at healthcare sectors, only 21% of health centers in sub-Saharan Africa have access to reliable and affordable lighting. So maybe linking that to the fourth area of communication and partnerships. Uh, maybe quickly on communication, it's important to share more of the good stories. 
so that mm. people see the logic. They also see the analogies. So this is this is not unique, but it, it's urgent and big, but it's not unique. It's something that is, has been universal over history in, in developing cultures and developing countries and developing sectors so that, that needs to be shared. But then if you think about partnerships and breaking down <laughs> the big ecosystem challenge in, in smaller digestible uh, bites, um, mm. So maybe, so I was also going to use the word lighthouse programs. So could we define together with ISA and with countries involved a lighthouse program on healthcare centers? So universal access to sustainable lighting for healthcare centers. Mm -hmm. Could we combine with this also develop, uh, that could be national, it could also be more local, uh, capacity building. Because capacity building is nothing else than you could say like a fancy word for developing technological skills. Again, using the analogy of, of my grandparents, so when people had access to electricity, of course you needed technical capabilities for people to maintain the electricity network, to repair and to service the products that people were acquiring. Uh, and again, have you see that once people have access to this and also women in this, are, are, as we see, through our foundation work uh, much stronger and uh, much more powerful and much more passionate and uh, much more sustainable in these efforts. Uh, so thereby also contributing to a more balanced uh, development agenda. So I would say technology, look at what is really the winning technology policies and make it a <clears throat> big national priority, but with enabling policies underneath, uh, financing and business models, make it service-based and circular, and then partnerships hey, and then those digestible Bytes and programs of which I mentioned uh, too, but probably there are quite a few more uh, that, that also my fellow panelists uh, yeah, could propose. Thank you very much, Harry. You've covered very, very uh, key, key um, areas uh, that, that have helped, I think, the sector so far and, and maybe advancing those areas would be the solution, like you said, to be able to address uh, the people who are still unelectrified. Um, Dr. Nicola, if you can conclude, if you can help us uh, by adding on to what has been said, any um, key areas you think should be addressed? Yeah, I think Harry summed it up brilliantly with regards to the technology and how it's not just that and it's how you integrate that all the way through. I think a key priority from my side in the Energy Catalyst program is really looking at the sustainability and legacy of our project. I think this applies to a lot of the grant funding that's around in this sector. Um, a lot of it provides funding to get over the first hurdle, but how do we help the projects get over the second, third or fourth hurdle to actually integrate them and re release their potential? Because there's a lot of, kind of kickstarting them, but maybe bringing together the networks and looking at how we integrate with investors and how we really create the whole journey for innovators to get their technology to where its potential really lies. I think that's key in, yeah, just been looking forward for sustainable and projects and the legacy that grant funding programs leave and making sure we don't just leave people hanging in where they got to and make them reinvent the wheel again and again. I think the second part touching on that is the lessons learned. As Luke said, it took him a lot of iterations to get to where he is now. How do we capitalize and use those lessons and collect them collaboratively and share those with the sector so that other people don't have to take the seven or eight iterations to get to the end game. Obviously, we don't want them to compete against Luke, but you know, actually use those lessons to apply them to maybe different technologies um, that actually reach that end goal. So yeah, more about the lessons learned and looking at how we create sustainable projects with good legacies to all of our grant funding programs. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Nicola. I, I really like what you've said in terms of collaboration and learning from others. And we've heard from ISA and I think the World Bank talking about projects where they have projects in Asia and Africa. And some of those things can, it can be like learning from one region to the other. And like you said, or yeah. maybe technology to technology or business model to another business model. And of course, sustainability of financing, helping innovation skill and go to the market and be able to um, uh, sustain themselves within that particular market by providing the right kind of support uh, through collaboration and look, from an entrepreneurial perspective, what do you think should be prioritized to scale of grid solutions in Africa? I think um, the panelists so far have, have done a great job of, uh, 
of talking about the things that are going on. And uh, I think it's an incredible amount of finance available and, um, you know, m making sure that those, those, those finances go towards bankable projects is really important. I think I see our role in this is connecting, you know, our, our super rural customers um, with, with that kind of finance and being an intermediary and saying, hey, how can we connect these customers who even the poorest of our customers are spending about 20% of their household income on their energy needs today, but they're spending it on a really poor provision. They're spending it on the wrong things um, um, because they don't have access to good services that can do that more affordably and provide them a high level of service. And then you've got investors um, at the top end who are looking for these bankable projects. So I see our role in the next couple of years as being able to help those investors serve those ultimate customers by providing the linkage, the data, the information, and the technology to be able to go down um, and meet those customers where they are. Um, I think um, often in the off-grid sector, we've asked customers to, to step up to where we are in terms of how we want to manage debt, how we want to manage technology. Um, and I think one of the really exciting things I see with mobile power in the next couple of years is that we can meet customers where they are and we can meet investors where they are in terms of what they want from bankable returns. And what we're seeing right now is the ability to connect those two. Um, and that, that, that's why profitability is so important. You know, ultimately what I mean, it was talking about with, with bankable projects means profitable projects. Um, and I think there is no reason that our customers can't be served profitably. They're spending an incredible amount of their income on energy already. Um, it's just about meeting and, and intermediate, uh, being an intermediary between those two levels. So we're really excited to do that. Um, it's, it's great to see some, some, some people we've been working with in Nigeria on the call as well. So really excited for, for the way in which the ecosystem has developed over the last 10 years and the point at which um, we are today. I think it's a very exciting time. Thank you very much, Luke. So uh, in conclusion, being that connecting party between uh, the investors and the local market whereby you reach them, I think what we hear people saying is that the, the, the low hanging fruits in the sector have been picked. So having to go deep to the last mile and, and localizing your solution or at the same time, having that connection to the investors is key, of course, to addressing the, the 600 million who are still missing from good electrification. Um, unless, I don't know whether we have any other question um, in Telecom. No, Shalmat, I think that's it in terms of the questions we had. Uh, great. Any, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, unless any other uh, any member of the panel has any other point they wish to, to say or a question or, or an issue they want to raise, I want to conclude this session and thank you very much for everyone. Thank you very much to the audience. Uh, thank you very much to the IntelliCup team. And thank you very much, of course, to our distinguished panelists, uh, Luke, uh, Dr. Nicola, Harry, uh, His Excellency Tripathi, and of course, Dr. Amit, and uh, Yangna, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, <laughs> Yangia. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for launching that report. We are looking forward to um, reading the report and seeing the insights that you have come up with. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you so much, Helmut. And thank also, you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for taking out the time and uh, thank you to all our panelists uh, for, for dialing into this very, very critical and important session. It was extremely, very, very insightful for all of us. And I will be making some connections post the session where some of the participants have reached out to us. So I'll be reaching out to you uh, uh, post the session, but uh, thanks again for taking out the time. We also request all the participants to please visit the exhibition booths uh, where a lot of uh, the energy enterprises which are supported by our partners, some of whom are in the panel, uh, are hosted on the Brella platform. So please do check them out and uh, please enjoy the rest of the sessions for the, for the day. There are lots of sessions on energy and climate change coming up. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.